Welcome back to Ally Bullies TV and joining us today we have 216 WB Block Knots, Ohio, the man himself, Mr. Lawrence Whedon. Good morning, man. How you doing today? Good morning, fine of you. I'm all right. Um, like with every guest, I kind of, you know, I like to get a little back history on, you know, how you got into the dog. So if you can explain to the viewers out there, maybe. How long have you been into dogs and how long have you been into the American bully breed of dog? Well, as a kid, you know, we all grew up with dogs. So I had a fun um, thing for American pit bulls. Actually, I didn't even know that they were pit bulls until my grandfather told me we had a garage full of them and we used to play with them and they used to lock onto things and you know, they, they performance level as pups was really high, and I was really turned on by that. So when I got older, I started purchasing my first pit bull, and I started breeding, and i always been into the discipline of the dogs, the training. To me, what's the purpose of getting a dog if you don't have control over it? Um, first thing for me, I personally, I don't do treat training. My dogs have to listen and do what I ask them to do. If they don't do it, guess what? Just like your kids, put them in time out, take something away. We come back, we do it again. And then repetition is the key. Um, because think about it, your dogs just sit around all day waiting for you to pour something into them. So if you don't pour anything into them, that's what you're gonna get. And you can't get mad. Um, even if you take it to a trainer, it's still your job to go back and do what the trainer's done. If you don't do that, you're not going to get the same results. So overall, I've probably been breeding American pit bulls for eight, eight to 10 years. I sold a lot of great pit bulls, love pit bulls, even to this day. It's just that they got a bad rap and it's not the dogs anytime it's the owner. Right. Um, but they definitely have a target on their back. And when you have people that don't do their research, it makes for a bad relationship. Um, so to American, uh, bullies, I've been breeding them for maybe four years almost. Okay. And I was always, I started off with my standard American standard, which my cousin, um, he was a pretty good, well-known breeder. He does shows. Um, he's doing re really well. He's from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, but he sold me my first American bully standard. I drove, I got off work. <laughs> I told my wife, she thought I was crazy. I basically, <laughs> I was just determined to get one. I just loved everything about it. And it still kind of reminded me of the American Pit Bull. So I got off work, probably relaxed for like an hour or two, drove to Allentown, PA. Um, some things transpired where we didn't meet up at the time we supposed to. And a 12 hour trip turned into about an 18 to 20 hour trip. But I got my um, bully, came back, uh, my daughter was super excited that we were getting a dog when I brought her back. She was basically like, what is this? This, this <laughs> dog was so big. She was scared. And um, that's when I definitely start spending more time with the dog and my daughter. And she's a big part of 216WB. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, fix this. I want to put her on okay. to the camera, too. Okay. She could kind of squeeze in just a little bit there with you. Okay. That way we could get both of y'all in the camera. Mm -hmm. um, that's the next thing I was going to ask you about. I noticed that you have your daughter involved with the dogs as well. How important is that to have her involved with these dogs? That's very important. Um, for every entrepreneurship that I do or try to start up, I want to have generational wealth and growth. So my kids are very important. My daughter lives with me. She interacts with the dogs on a regular basis. She has a passion and love for the dogs also. So she's been hands-on training since she was three, four years old. She used to put the Vaseline on her face in the wintertime, go for the walks in the rain, had the rain boots on. Yeah, I, I see that. I see when I watch, like I said, <laughs> I follow you on social media and I watch majority Okay. nearly all of your videos and i do i see her interacting with the uh -huh. dogs walking at home depot that kind of stuff so you know yeah. i see it 
and she's hands on, like will not do um, socialization. She walks, walks the dogs in Home Depot or she handles the dogs. Like we have envisioned for her to be in a um, show and she's going to be a junior like handler. A, yeah, I was going to ask I that. didn't push that on her. Um, we discussed it. She watched some videos. She's intrigued by it. So my whole goal is not necessarily to win, to just venture out, get some experience, do a little exposure, and, and maybe encourage other African-American kids that we can do different things besides basketball, football, soccer, volleyball. Right. So that right. was one of the things that I wanted to do. Speaking on training your dogs, um, I, I actually I admire the way you got your dogs trained, man. You <laughs> know, you. I admire it. Um, is that something that you feel every dog owner should have down with their dog is the basic obedience? Um, yes. In my opinion, you have to do your research just like you buying a house, buying a car. You have to see what fits you. If you definitely don't have time for it, it's probably not a good fit. Um, you just don't want to buy a pet and have them sit around. You should have some kind of basic obedience. I'm not saying canine training, but basic obedience, six come stay. But a lot of it starts, and people don't do their research, is with the, um, your tools, for, especially for American bully dogs or so-called bigger dogs, more aggressive. You have to have the proper tools for the job, just like a regular job. You, without your right tools, you can't do the job. So you need a prone collar, number one not a choker collar. That's a big difference. It does have little um, prongs on it, not spikes or nothing. It doesn't hurt them, but it gives them resistance to let them know they can't pull. You need the proper chains, not a retractable leash, <laughs> right? stuff like that. And it's just really to show the dogs that you're in control. They're not in control of you, but that's where it starts. Without that, in my opinion, you're failing. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to start talking about the breeding aspect of these dogs. Um, I know off camera you was telling me that, you know, you got an upcoming breeding that you got planned. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you do to get a female dog prepared for an upcoming breeding? Pretty much the same routine that I do. Um, basic obedience, uh, food, getting her ready for a pregnancy, uh, vaccinations. I, I'm real picky about keeping my dog circle small. We do do socialization, but I'm going to succeed and not succeed with my dogs. So I keep my dogs intact. Um, they have a good relationship. They socialize with each other. But just your basic feeding, vaccination, and uh, taking the proper steps um, is things that I've done in the past and some things I didn't do. So definitely getting the vaccinations important, the testing, um, timing is very important, but the testing is, is key, getting your pedestrian, um, making sure the levels is right. We do AI on top of natural breeding, but everything is in-house. I try to use local breeders like uh, the Bully Clinic. He's great. It's another guy on the west side, Larry. He breeds. Um, I think uh, pockets, but he's well known in the city. A lot of people go to him from different states, also. All right. Um, speaking of breed, and I I noticed like you know now you got some people that you know offer like whelping services where you know you can have a litter, you can bring your puppies, and they take them and they whelp them. Do you prefer to whelp your own litters, or would you be used? Would you be open? maybe using a service like a whelper in the future? Absolutely not. <laughs> I would whelp my own litter. Uh, my daughter will help be a part of that. Uh, my wife will come down and check on them periodically. But I think um, every litter is different. And that's really a hands-on experience that I think every breeder should go through. It's, it's certain things that goes on with whelping. Um, it's really personal. 
with every pup, with the mother. Um, it's just a hands-on experience I think everybody should go through. Um, and there's certain things that I want to do. I want to make sure they're getting proper sleep. I want to make sure the mother's resting. Um, I want to make sure the nutrition is right. It's just a lot of things that I'm not going to trust other people. And then things happen when you will. So if anything happened, I can't put it on somebody else if I technically wasn't there myself. Right. So would you consider uh, like somebody who maybe, you know, all right, they got a progesterone, they went and got an AI, then they went and got a C-section, then they dropped the puppies off to a welfare. Would you consider somebody like that to be a breeder? Would you call them a breeder? Uh -oh. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. a tricky question. Uh, I, I guess, I mean, you have to go through the whole process. I mean, if you whelp your litter, whether you were successful or not, you went through the process. They took all the proper steps. So, yeah, I would call them a breeder. Okay. Um. What are some of the things you do to get prepared for the newborn puppies, you know, before the litter even drops? Like, what are some of the things you do to get prepared for these new puppies? Um, just materials, definitely. Uh, making sure you have pretty much all the materials you need, like your heating lamp. Make sure you got light bulbs for your lamp. Proper whelping box. Everybody uses different things. Some people have box with the PVC pipe in it. Some people use swimming pools or uh, wood chips or cedar chips or pelletized pellets. Whatever you choose to use, proper spacing. Make sure you got a good blanket. <laughs> right. Because you're going to be, wherever you set up your whelping, is hands-on. Like, it's, I hate to say it, but the first three weeks is really tough. Um, you lose a lot of sleep. Um, you got to make sure the mother's doing her part. You might have to buy some bottles because she might not be producing milk. She might not like it. I mean, if you think about it, if you have anywhere between 8 to 12 pups um, nurturing on you, how would you feel? So It's funny you <laughs> say that, man. I, I, I was looking at a guy who had uh, like 12 puppies, and I was thinking that to myself, like, mm -hmm. man, he got a job on his hands. Because, right. you know, having 12 puppies, it's a lot, man. It is. Like you said, you got to sometimes the mother might not be producing enough milk. and You got to get in there and you got to, you know, food. supplement that. And yes. That's yes. rough. You got to have those bottles. We've done it. My daughter's helped me. We've bottle fed. And then you got to make sure that even with the bottle, that the proper milk is coming out, the flow of the milk, the nipple or the hole isn't big enough. You might have to squeeze it, force feed. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot with welfare. <laughs> Right. Speaking of like what you just said about, you know, the flow of the milk coming out of the mm -hmm. nipple, that can lead to aspiration problems yes. as well. Like, and that's something, you know, you definitely. Right. Don't that's want. what I'm saying. You, that's why I said it's better, in my opinion, to whelp your own litter so you can have hands on training. You can see and acknowledge everything that's going on so you don't blame anybody if anything happens. Because unfortunately, when you have puppies in the litter, I hate to say it, you normally lose one or two um, for various reasons. Um, you, can, you can do everything to the best of your ability and a puppy or two just not going to make it. Uh, right. Even with that being said, you know, some people keep, it's different for everybody. Some people keep the mother. I've seen people keep the mother in the whelping box, which to me is, wow, I, I, that's insane to me. Um, but my hat goes off to him. But with one of my females, the first litter, you know, she always wanted to be in there. I had to get her out, separate her. Then it got to a certain point where it was just overwhelming for her. And she didn't want to come back. Right. But the next litter, after three weeks, I pulled them off. And she couldn't wait to get away from them. <laughs> it's funny you said that um, the last litter that I actually had with my puppies, the female, like you said, she wanted to stay around the puppy mm -hmm. so badly and I would separate them. Mm -hmm. And I had separated them one night and put her up in the crate and I came down maybe like 2 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. She had broke through the crate 
<laughs> and was in the in the inside the welcome box with the puppies though. I'm yeah. like, yeah, every 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 mother is different, but they need that rest. They need to get their nutrition up. They need that separation. The puppies got to learn how to so-called progress, be independent, and puppies need they rest. Right. Uh, but you got to think about it. If you just leave the mother in the in the whelping box or whatever with the litter, and the puppies have access to eat all day, they sucking the nutrition out of her all day. Literally, they're sucking her dry, and she can die. Right. And you you know you don't want no overweight puppies either. And I know a lot of guys they think of these uh, of American bully, and everybody wants this big chunky puppies off the rip and all of that but you can have overweight puppies as well exactly and your puppies will let you know when they're full um they're gonna fall asleep once they fall asleep let them rest right don't won't wake them up that's why i said every litter is different everybody breeds different whelp litter is different you know someone told me a known breeder said every two three hours you gotta feed them which is insane like and I tried to do it because it was my first time whelping it. And it drove me crazy, drove the mother crazy. <laughs> and as we went on, weeks after weeks, we learned that we can go a little bit longer. By the time we had the second litter, it might have been every four hours or whenever they woke up. They might have woke up and played, was a little antsy. But rest is really key when you uh, whelping those litters, too. They need that rest. Right, right. Um do you have like you know people make different kind of like mush for the puppies when they get off the mom and all of that do you have a specific recipe that you like to you know put together and if so uh i know you might not want to give up so much (laughs) game but if you can you know let let the viewers out there who may be new to this and may be watching this video Uh, and you know they want to learn you know uh, how to make a mush recipe or something like that. Can you explain, you know, yeah, what, what goes into it? Right. I don't really have a go-to. Actually, I'm excited for this next one because there's some things that I want to use. And I like natural foods versus um, buying, like, the dyeing and stuff like that. In my opinion, that's no good. It's just a scent. It's just fish oil. Um, so whatever your kibbles is, whatever kibbles you use, um, just, you know, blend it up. Agile, goat's milk, um, tractor supply, that's where I go. From there, if you want to put some kind of supplement in there, you can do that. But I normally use, like, um, recently I use mackerel, which is basically sardines but bigger. And that, uh, that gives them omega-3 fatty acids. And you can put, like, a vegetable in there, green beans or something like that, and mush it up and just see how that goes. But the mush stage is probably the worst stage <laughs> to go through because 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 as far as the mess you oh, think you know with them it's just, it it's and just getting a mess. It all over you're, you're happy that the puppies are off the mother but it's a lot of cleaning up it's a lot of cleaning <laughs> yeah it is it is um like I was saying, like you got puppies stepping in it then oh. you gotta you gotta you gotta watch out for that too you gotta make sure you know that the area is that they eat and the environment is clean because yeah they gonna step in that food and you don't want nothing getting in there and they ingesting and, that and the fact that you said that that's why i say whelping your own litter is key where you can't blame that on somebody else right right cleaning clean the litter is tough <laughs> um i know you you spoke on it just a little bit briefly um what age do you generally take the puppies off the mother for feeding? Is it is it like something you know you play it by sight and by ear and you figure like you know all right because I know it's different right. for every litter. Some some people do like four weeks. My last litter I actually did three weeks. It it just depends kind of. If you have twelve pups, ten pups, that's a lot for the mother. So for me. Three weeks, I would say three weeks. If they're able to eat mush, um, I would let them three weeks. And I, if some puppies were struggling, I'll still incorporate the mother with the other pups. But generally, I want the mother to heal, get right. better, get her rest, get her weight back up. And I want my puppies to be independent. Even if I have to bottle feed, I'll bottle feed. But three weeks for me is good. And basically, 
at three weeks, I start training puppies. Okay. Um, I want to talk about that stud you got over there. <laughs> um, for people that, that may not follow you, what, what's, that, what's the name of that stud you got over there in your program right now? Well, we call him Bam. Okay. <laughs> um, is, is Bam currently open for stud? And if so, what is Bam's stud price right now? Yes, he is open, and for pricing, they will have to DM me. Okay. How can how can someone contact you? You know, where can they reach you at on social media um, for them to inquire about using your stud? I have a Instagram page, Cartier10. They can direct message me. I also have a Twitter page. We also have a Snapchat page, and we also have a YouTube page. And I normally put a little bit of all that on my Instagram, which is my main page. Okay. Um, if somebody was thinking about using your stud, mm -hmm. what is the process for someone that was using your, wanted to use your stud? Like, I know we just briefly went over, you know, how to contact, mm -hmm. but what other procedures and things like that do you have in place when someone comes to use your stud? Uh, me personally, I will have to look at the kennel, um, see what kind of dog they have, what are they trying to incorporate in their kennel. To me, it's not just about the money. Um, I, I really want to produce great dogs. Um, if someone's using my dog, naturally, they're probably intrigued by his bone, his muscle tone, his drive. So I would think that they're probably lacking something like that. So that's why they would use them. Um, but even with that said, he definitely can give you the bone, but the, the drive still comes to the owner of right. uh, the kennel. Uh, and I think that's something that kennels and other breeders are not being honest with telling new time breeders or kennels when they use a stud or get a pup, you still have to put the work in. Right. Speaking of the bone on that male stud, you got Bam Bam. <laughs> he has incredible bone and incredible muscle on him, man. Um, just recently, I saw that video you posted. I think he was eating, and I, I had commented on it. Mm. Um, the muscle that was just popping out on that <laughs> boy, man. When I was watching that video, I was like, whoa. You know, and for just what a lot of people don't know, too, like videos and pictures do these dogs no justice. Nah. So for me to see that in the right. video, right. I'm like, if right. I see this dog in person, right. I just know, oh, you yeah, know, you it's going to be than welcome to come see it's but be that's, incredible. That's one of the things that I started doing more, um, trying to do a couple videos where you actually can see a moving so I can show that it's no Photoshop. Um, it's my dog, it's our environment, um, but a lot of things like people say pheno genotype, which is important, but nutrition is definitely important, but it's really exercise, right? Um, that's one of the key things that I try to do with my dogs. Um, just like if we, people say, if your uncle or my father's naturally big, you might think it's hereditary, but at the end of the day, if you don't put the work in, it's not going to pop. Right, right. So exercise is really key with my dogs. We exercise everybody. Everybody got a different level, but for the most part, all the dogs have a high level. Yeah, but see, you know, like you said about the training, it's also a reflection of the owner to a certain degree because I know – you train your dogs, I'm pretty sure you got some type of training background yourself as far as like you yeah. exercising and mm -hmm. training and right. working out and doing this. So it kind of, you right. know, people that's into that kind of stuff, they self, mm -hmm. they kind of tend to train their dogs. Cause like, I like working out, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? I don't look at it as like a job or right. it's something I like to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I train my dogs as well. So I think kind of like, you know, your dog a lot of times is somewhat a reflection of yourself too. So nice. you got people that got lazy dogs, <laughs> nine times out of 10, <laughs> that owner may be lazy. Right, and, that, and that's true. And that's one of the things that you just said with the American Bullies, 
I mean, you can make that. You can make any dog what you want to do with it, but it's up to you. Uh, but the American bullies, they do have high drive just because. And that was one of the things that I just couldn't believe because people think because they're a big dog, they can't work. They, they can't do certain things. And like Mr. T said, I pity the fool. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, these dogs, they're dogs. All dogs have high levels. You just got to bring it out in them. And like you said, for the most part, it is kind of a reflection of you. It, it really is. I was in the military. I work out. Um, yeah, I fall off every once in a while. I know how to meal prep. So I'm into that kind of stuff. I know what comes with the working out, what, what's the process to get to where you want to be. And I love seeing the results when you put the work in. You can see the reflection of that in your dog, though. <laughs> what you just said, like, you know, you got a military background, uh -huh. you like the work. You can see that mm -hmm. in your dogs. Anybody that been following your page and watch you and your dogs, you can see that that's a reflection of, of you and your dogs, you know. Um, what what is the what is the blood behind Bam Bam? He has he definitely has bossy in him. I don't know his pet all the way, but he definitely has bossy. Um, I got him from a, a kind of a well known breeder, um, Beer Kennels. Okay. Um, he was a pretty during COVID. He was a guy that I got in contact with um, out of Baltimore. I got him from him. I'm um, familiar with them. Yeah. Um, it's a lot in them. <laughs> right. But at the end of the day, like I always say, pedigree, Gino Fino, it's only important to some people. Um, at the end of the day, even the paperwork, it's important, but not really in my opinion. Um, the dog is as good as you make them. To some people, the, the paperwork is going to sell the dog. Um, in my opinion, that's really not that important. Uh, when I look at a dog or purchase a dog in the past, I look at the mother. I look at the father. I don't care about four to six generations. Um, everything I need to see is right there in front of me. The mother, the father. I can basically have an idea of the bone, the dome, the the structure, the temperament is right in front of you. All right. Paperwork is a background of like a birth certificate, basically. Right. But you still have to put the work in. And that's what these kennels are not telling people. Um, <laughs> it, it, like I say, it's an everyday experience with the dogs. Okay. Um, while we're on the topic of studs, mm -hmm. In your opinion, you know, you got some people out here that say, you know, my stud is a super producer or what have you. In your opinion, what would make a stud be considered a super producer? Like what 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 would this stud dog have to be doing, in your opinion, to be labeled as a super producer? He have to have litters on the ground that I've actually seen and they have to be consistent. Uh, one of the people or breeders that I love is um, Phantom or Swagger, the Two-Faced Merle. Right. His consistency is consistent. Like he has a distinct look, and that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the look of all the pups, the litters. It's pretty much the same DNA. Um, who else? Um, Florida State Bullies with Future. That's my um my that's female a, that's father. A champion. Yeah. Oh, champion, yeah champion, champion future. Future, right? Right. And that's my female juice. That's juice father. Oh, okay. So I look at the the um the consistency of the litters, and that's to me what makes a, a great stud. Just because he looks good don't mean he's a good producer. You have to see what he actually produced. And right. um just follow like you can follow the bloodline. Right, because you can have you could have two males from the same litter mm -hmm. and one may produce over and over and over again and the other male from the litter may not produce. He may not even throw none of his qualities on right. the dog. It's consistency for me just to see what they produce. When it comes to breeding these dogs, you know, 
what do you what's your opinion on far as like you know who is more important in a breed and like who, who which is the sire or the dam which one brings more to the table in that's, a breeding that's tough um that's tough um people will probably say the female which i kind of believe the female is the key um because she's going to birth them they're going to take a lot of probably 50 60 percent of her traits so the female is is very important that she has a good structure temperament um for some people color performance the female is very important um the male, on the other hand, I hate to say it, is just a donor, basically. Um, but when you do your um, breeding, you want to compensate the female. I can't have a female with a 25-inch head, great bone structure, and get a male with a 21-inch head. So it has to make sense. Okay. If you want to, <laughs> I mean, it's still, at the end of the day, it's in God's hand, but you still want to try to pair them up where you can be successful. Right, right. You want to match up two dogs that, you know, kind of kind of are the same right. visually, mm -hmm. but you know one may be lacking something that the right. other one, you and, know. And got. that's that what you just said right there. If the dog is lacking that much, then you might not want to breed those two dogs. Right. If I have one dog with a 25-inch head and the other dog has a 21-inch head, that might not be a good breed. Exactly. You might have a 30, 70 litter. Right, right. Where you got a bunch of big structure dogs with little heads. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, right. So it's you kind of want to match it up really close. Like my boy Bam and Juice, they compensate each other. My boy has better muscle structure. He's a little shorter, but the heads are pretty much equal. Her, actually, my female is bigger than my male. But that's a great thing. They are average it out. So right. either way it go, I'm not going to lose, I believe, with this breeding because you're going to get bone and dome. <laughs> when, when is this breeding uh, plan to take place? Uh, we're just waiting for the cycle, the heat cycle. So hopefully okay. it'll she'll be in heat sometime this month. Oh, okay. Soon then. Mm -hmm. um, what do you typically uh, sell puppies for? And can you kind of explain why the price would be what it would be? And that's something that I discuss with people. Um, but it's, I'm not out here to break people. Um, I will do payments, but that's something that we do, you know, discuss. Behind with closed the, doors, correct. Behind closed doors. And everybody budgets different. You know, Reason why I was asking, you know, a lot of people don't understand, like, you know, you get people where they contact you for a puppy and you mm -hmm. tell them a price and sometimes it's, whoa, that, right. that's a lot of money. Or well, it's, People it's, don't understand what goes in behind the scenes to be able to bring these puppies. Right. I mean, it's, it's a lot that goes into it. I mean, just the preparation. Just imagine here in Ohio, Cleveland, if you got to get a C-section, a C-section costs $3,000. If you don't schedule the C-section and you have to do emergency C-section, that's $3,500. That's 3500 you're starting in the hole. So you can go off of that alone. We're not even talking about eight to 10 weeks of nurturing, neutering the dogs, getting them ready, your food, your cleaning materials, whelping box, your time, your training. So you can visualize a price in your head just off of those facts. People don't understand like, you know, like me, I don't breed a lot. Mm -hmm. So you got years and years of you feeding these dogs, mm -hmm. you deworming these mm -hmm. dogs, you vaccinating these dogs, you out there cleaning up dog poop <laughs> behind these dogs, you still got a job you work. You know, it's a lot that go right. into dealing with these dogs. So, you know, if I produce an animal, out of all of this hard work and dedication that I'm putting into what I got going on, there's no way that I can sell you a puppy for five hundred dollars. And it's not because you know right. it's not about the money. For right. like, I'm just trying to get rich. That's why right. I need this price of this. 
is no, you paying for quality, you paying for my time, mm -hmm. all of that, you know, goes into right. the price of a puppy. You just gotta have a firm price and just know your worth. Um, like you said, it, it, everything that you said is true. Your time, training, vaccinations, food, cleaning, it's a lot. You work, come home, take care of the dog. Some people have to take vacation time to whelp litters. Um, it, it's a lot that goes into it. So you just got to just know your worth and just stick to it. Now, I know, you know, what is the process if somebody was getting a puppy from you? You know, somebody contacted you today and said, hey, I watched the video. I know you got an upcoming breeding going. What is the process for them to be able to even purchase a puppy from you? Um. I, I kind of screen them. This this up and coming litter, I'm trying to produce something really special, and I want responsible people with the dogs. That's that's really important to me. You kind of want to keep up with your dogs, your litter, pups, whatever you want to say, and which you always can't. But you just want responsible people with these dogs. Um, hopefully, they followed us, learned some things from us. Um, if they want to contact me on breeding or training tips or feeding regimens, I have no problem with that. But at the end of the day, it's still a business. So deposits are the first thing. Everybody said they want a pup. Right. So, you know, at the end of the day, the deposits are important. And, and that's the beginning of it. Okay. Um, is it a, is it a, is it like a contract or anything like that that you have people also uh, maybe sign or go through? Or I can do contracts, but most of the time it's personal. Uh, my page is the same. They have my number. Uh, some people know my address. It's really personal. We can do contracts, but in my opinion, um, once you sign over the paperwork, the ABKC paperwork, it's your dog. Right. <laughs> right, right. Sure dog. Um, what are your what are what are you aiming to achieve in your next couple of breedings that you got lined up? Like, you know, what what are you aiming to do? Honestly, I just want my own um bloodline, hopefully pet own bloodline of pedigree. I'm aiming to have uh, I want my kennel to be known as great temperament. Uh, well, all around dogs, family oriented. I want my customers, grandmother or mother, to be able to walk the dogs comfortably. So I'm trying to have trained puppies that I'm getting rid of. I want them to see my daughter interacting with the puppies so their kids can interact with the puppies. I don't really show the protection mode, but that's really key. Your dog has to be able to protect your house, your wife, your kids. So when you have a relationship with your dogs, there's certain things that your dog's gonna do for you. So I just wanna produce well all around great bullies that um, people are well educated on and, and see that this is a time process. It's not something that's gonna come overnight. It's repetition, it's patience, it's love. It's all that. So when you get a puppy from 216WB, you should be able to have a good all-around puppy for me. Okay. Um, I want to touch on something you just said as far as, like, you know, sending, sending a, a, a puppy to their new owner's train. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think, like, you know, when people have these litters mm -hmm. at seven, eight weeks, they're ready to push them out the door. Um, <laughs> do you think that us as breeders, maybe we need to start holding on to these puppies. I mean, I know everybody don't have the space and things like that, so they can't keep a whole lot of dogs. But do you think we maybe need to start keeping on a hold of these puppies, maybe the 12, 14, even 16 weeks, maybe just to just to do just that, make them more trained, be already more trained a little bit, you know, before they get into these homes and these owners take a hold of these dogs. What's your opinion on that? Uh, as a breeder, I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> um, eight to 10 weeks, 10 weeks is, 
After 10 weeks, you're ready to let them go. Uh, <laughs> 10 weeks, you're ready to let them go. Um, whatever you poured into them is what you poured into them. 12 to 16 weeks, you're not even dealing with a puppy no more. Right, that, right, that's right. another uh, person to feed, clean up, more responsibility. Um, so I would say 8 to 10. 10 weeks, is, is that's it. <laughs> 10 weeks, get them out of there. Whatever you train them, hey. You could call me if you need some piggyback to do some more training. But as a, as a buyer, you have to know what you're getting. So I think the buyer has to know that you got to keep incorporating this training. I don't think, I mean, we can keep one to 16 weeks and you buy a puppy from me and you don't do anything after I, you get the puppy. So the buyer has to know what they have to do once they, you know, purchase the puppy. Right, right. Um... I've been hearing, like, you know, a lot of, in the XL bully community, I've been hearing, like, you know, a lot of talking, like, you know, that the XL bullies, they, like, they lacking, like, the breed type. Mm -hmm. Breed type, you know, they saying, like, a lot of XLs, you know, they, they got that more massive look. Some of them, you know, some of them two terriers, some of them this and that. Um... Do you feel that the XL bully is lacking breed type? And if so, in your opinion, what do you feel can be done to bring more breed type to the XL bully? Uh, and, and that's a question kind of, it's a personal opinion. Um, because standards, if you go about standards, what's the standards of a, a XL bully? You know, you got two dogs that make up one dog, which is genuinely a mutt, if we're going to be honest. Standards only really make sense or even mean thing when you're in the show because you need certain standards to get in a dog show. Without those standards, your dog doesn't even get into the show. So in my opinion, it's just a vision that you have. You know, everybody's trying to create something. It's a market for everybody and everything. If you're happy with what you're creating, more power to you. Um, but if you're doing a show, it's standards according to the ABKC. So you have to have certain amount of American Pit Bull Terrier. You got to have certain Bulldog. Um, so, so standards is just what your vision is as a kennel or as an owner to me. Okay. Um, everybody that come on the show, I ask, you know, whether they XL bully breeders, exotic bully breeders, French bulldog breeders, name some of your top XL bullies in the game right now. In my opinion? In your opinion. Like I said, Swagger, Kennel, Phantom, like I said, Florida State, Bossy Kennel, um, it's the guy, Nolo Bullies, we got uh, bossed up bullies. We got a guy in Atlanta, Monster. I think it's Money Monster Bully out of Atlanta. It's so many. Right, it's right. so many. Like, in my opinion, you know, it's a lot. They're, they've been doing it for a while. They have a great following. Those kennels that I named, to me, they just have consistency. All their productions is pretty much the same. You getting the same quality. It's nothing that's really not good quality. The puppies look amazing. The parents look amazing. The temperament is amazing. They're taking great shots. They're taking videos. You can see them move. You can go visit them. Um, so that's 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 the ones that I really like. It's it's like I said. It's a lot of breeders out here. A lot of nice kennels. I try to keep up with certain ones, but to be honest, I'm in my own lane, trying to create my own vision, but I do incorporate and take advice from other kennels, but I'm trying to do my own thing. Right, right. Um, what advice would you give to new breeders? As far as you know, maybe if, if a young man got up under you for maybe some mentorship. What what advice would you give to, to some young breeders out here, man? Do your research. <laughs> Do your research. Uh, 
Make sure the bully fits your personality or whatever kind of dog you're getting. Make sure it fits your personality. Make sure you have time, definitely. The space, patience, money. <laughs> uh, just, just overall, the time is, time is, is important uh, because you just can't let the dog sit around all day. Like I, I in the wintertime, I shovel my backyard. I, I see. I, I make yeah. a path for my dogs because if you think about it, you don't want to walk in three to four inches of snow. Right. Neither do the dogs. And then right. guess what? The dogs don't want to go out in that. They don't want to use the bathroom. You can't get mad at them. So it's a sacrifice. You you have to be consistent. And I think your dogs pick up on stuff like that when you show them that we in this together. Um they perform for you better. They listen to you better. You know, I do a thing where kind of slacking off, but every night for 30 minutes to an hour, I just have my dogs relax and we just kind of play or have them just lay down, do a couple commands, but it's our downtime, chill out time, but just let them know that we're all in this together before they actually call it a night. So the time and impatience is, is real important for anybody who gets a dog. All right. Um, is it with how often, how often do you deworm your dogs? And is it any particular dewormer that you like to use? Um, as a puppy or as an adult dog? Well, we could, we're going to say for puppies and adults. Um, I just go to Tractor Supply, do it yourself. They got various different products, whatever you're comfortable with. They have powder, they have liquid. Um, I love Tractor Supply. They're very knowledgeable. You got a lot of people who breed, have farmers, and they're hands-on. They can point you to the right direction, save you a lot of money. Um, the stuff is right there. And you just follow the guidelines. If it's say three to six weeks, twelve weeks, a year, whatever the guidelines is, that's that's what you go. You can you can never really go wrong with the worm, especially as a puppy. Um, I forgot. It's been a minute since I had my last litter. I want to say it's four weeks, maybe. Could be wrong. Four weeks, and then six weeks, and then eight weeks, um, three times. But you want to make sure, for me, I would do it probably the four weeks when in mush stage or transferring over to hard uh, kibble. So I would do powder. If it didn't look like each individual dog wasn't, puppy wasn't eating, then I would get the liquid to make sure that that's really important. You don't want your dogs to have worms. Now, adults is a little different. Um, the spacing is way different. But with the with the adult dogs, your vaccinations are important. The six months, your year rabies, stuff like that. The deworming, you know, watch their stool, see it. That's kind of as needed. Right, 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 right. Um, I was watching the I was watching another little podcast, and you know, one of the topics they was discussing was like, um, you know, maybe some of these kennel not kennels but uh these kennel clubs like abkc and ukc and things like that mm -hmm. maybe should start implementing like dna profiling of the dogs if you're breeding dogs like far as like you know if you have a dog registered with them mm -hmm. and you plan on breeding the dog then you need to get a dna profile so that they can have the dna on file maybe like at the abkc or the ukc that way when someone maybe has a puppy and you know they could contest whether or not you know that 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 sire is actually the sire only because you know i think you know in this dog stuff you got people sometimes who where people shipping you know dog stud out across the country you know you might somebody might breed to want to breed to say bam bam and instead of getting bam bam shipped <laughs> to them they didn't got hairy shipped <laughs> to them but the dog owner then told them it was from bam bam 
So that was the discussion, maybe, you know, to maybe do that to kind of alleviate some of that and weed out the, those kind of problems. What, what's your opinion on that? Um, I, I think that's asking a lot for a kennel to keep up with all of that. They're already producing shows and um, already checking paperwork, registrations. Now you want them to keep DNA. That's a lot, um, in my opinion. If you want to use a stud or a female, if you technically can't get to it, put hands on it or do it yourself, I don't think it should be done. Um, you know, for my first breeding, I actually drove. I got a pedestrian done by Bully Clinics in Ohio. Called the breeder that I wanted to use the stud for my first female it was in Baltimore. Listen to their advice, told me that the level was going to go up in a matter of days. I drove to Baltimore. I didn't wait for it to be shipped because when you ship, like you say, you don't know if it's there. Um, you lose things when it gets shipped. It's not as potent. Um, so I drove and, and, and met up with the breeder and did it right there, hands on. I spent the night overnight and came back with the second breeder. So in my opinion, I was comfortable. I knew what I was paying for. I knew what I was getting. So I wouldn't put that on them. I would say, you know, if you can't drive or meet up somewhere and and be personal, I, I wouldn't put that on any kennel to, to to keep up with that. That's kind of that's a lot you're asking, in my opinion. So, you know, would you advise like like what you just said, like would you advise like new breeders that's getting into this maybe to, you know, actually go out and actually breed to these studs in person versus, you know, getting this shipped across country and all of that? Would you advise maybe to, you know, hey, go put hands on these dogs, yes. get out here in the field and, you mm -hmm. know, go breed, go actually breed to that dog? Yeah, I, I would. I would say... Get on the road. If something you really like, if the breeder's willing to work with you, meet you, or some breeders might have been doing it long enough, they might actually fly you out there. Um, and then again, in my opinion now, because I've been doing it for a while, I only want to breed and produce in my yard. I'm not going outside the source. So that's the thing too. Once you're purchasing or get a stud credit, you should be comfortable with what you have and be confident in your yard. You shouldn't even be going outside your yard. You know, I'm not going to spend X amount of money on a, on a puppy. And then I don't even trust my puppy that I purchased to be a great stud or right. a great female. And, and for, for like new breeders or anybody getting into the game, what would you suggest for them to buy first? Would you suggest for them to buy a female first, if that, or or buy a male first? Which would you prefer for them to buy first, their first puppy? Female. Um, a female is your producer. She carries the puppies. Um, paperwork wise, you have the power. Um, it's a little more maintenance with a female because of the heat cycle, but it's not that hard. Um, she she's your money maker. That's that's the in my opinion, that's the most important the female. Okay. Um when it when it when it uh when it comes to like, you know, getting a female for the first time, if this your first puppy and you was looking to get a female, what what kind of advice would you give people, you know, maybe things to look for when you go on to, you know, inquire about, you know, purchasing this female, start your program off with? Um, it's, to me, it's, it's what's your vision? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to produce? Um, do you, I mean, some people like smaller dogs. You got, there's so many different breed types with the bullies. First of all, find out what breed type you want. When I first started, I had a standard. Love my standard. Uh, she came from a show background. Both parents were champions, grand champions, the father. Um, but I was just intrigued by just everything overall. But as I got into it, 
I started getting intrigued by the XLs. And I'm a bigger person, so it kind of fit my character. So you just got to figure out what fits your character. Um, right. If you're a smaller person, you might want a standard or a pocket, but you have to be able to handle that dog. And right, I think right. that's that's key. Then you have to look at um, what each breed type carries. Um, exotics, for instance. People might not have worked all the kinks and exotics. They might have more genetic problems or, or your Frenchies or, you know, you just got to see what's sturdy to you, what's going to last. It, it just got to make sense for you. Just got to do your research before you get it. If you want a big dog, exhales. You want a medium size, if you're in an apartment, exhales might not work for you. Right. <laughs> so, right. So it just has to make sense and, and fit your everyday lifestyle. And then, you know, once you do it for a while, you might so-called upgrade. Okay. Um, before we get out of here, what are your plans for 2024? And um, what's your plans maybe for moving your kennel forward? 2024, we hope to have two litters, hopefully. Um, moving forward, I hope to have my daughter by the end of the year, hopefully, to prep and be ready for her first junior handler show. Plan on probably keeping one pup, which my wife is not excited about, <laughs> one pup out of the litter so she can have hands-on trainers from day one. That's going to be her personal puppy, male or female, I'm not sure yet, but it'll sleep, she'll eat, feed, train. She's going to have a great relationship with that puppy from day one. So when they get in the show, they have a great bond, great connection, and just see how she does um, with that. And then, like I said, I just want to market, find some reliable people in the city. Because um, once you start breeding, having litters, you need help. <laughs> so I do have um, another person um, kennel, uh, Merritt Kennels, Chris Merritt, him and his wife. So just say, for instance, and that's another thing you have to keep in mind, the more dogs you get, the harder it is, uh, more time, it's harder to do things, especially if you got a family, go out of town, everybody don't want to put their dog in board and train. So if you have a team, somebody that can actually watch your dogs, while you say go out of town for two days, three days, that's a great thing to do. So you have to consider all this when you have that. And we were fortunate to be able to trust each other and we were able to go somewhere. They were able to go somewhere and we watched each other dogs. So that's real important. That's something that I didn't consider or even know about when I first got the dog. I didn't think about, well, we might take a trip. Who's going to watch the dogs? Because I did put my one of my dogs in a boarding house and it was uncomfortable because you know, it's a different environment for them. I'm not saying that the people are bad, but it's just a different environment. It's like dropping your kids off somewhere and they don't even know the people. A lot of what you just spoke on, you know, people that, that don't have dogs and they, oh, I want a dog, I want this many dogs. And they mm -hmm. don't understand what you just spoke on. When you've got multiple dogs, mm -hmm. it takes away from you being able to move around and do some of the things exactly. that you might want to do sacrifice. with your family. Exactly. Because you can't leave these dogs unattended for a whole week. You can't even leave these dogs unattended for a few <laughs> hours, you know, let alone a, a whole week. So like you said, um, that's very important, man, for people to understand and to know that getting into these dogs. And that's what I said. Like, I'm, I'm building a, you know, a so-called team, and I, and I have some good people on my team that we can watch each other dogs. They have multiple dogs. We have multiple dogs. And there hasn't been any problem with either one of us being able to go out of town. So that's very important. You can't have six to eight dogs and think you can just do what you want to do. You can't, um, man. You, you can't. So you have to keep in consideration if you marry, you know, if my wife want to go out of town and I can't go because I got dogs or I got a litter coming, tying. So you got to consider all that. Um, and it's tough, but you have to. Keep all that in mind when you're breeding, trying to increase your kennel, right. all that yeah. in mind. 
Um, Block Knox, Ohio. What 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 is that? Block Knox, Ohio <clears throat> is actually um, the kennel that Juice came from. Um, okay. He has multiple kennels. Uh, we were going to link up and try some things, so I kept his dogs for a little while. Got it to a certain degree. Um, kind of didn't work out, so we kind of parted ways. But you know, he's a great breeder, great kennel. All right. I got juice from Block Knox and Florida State produced juice. All right. And they're, they're great breeders, but at the end of the day, uh, we went separate ways. I just figured I want to stick to what I want to do. I want to pour into my vision versus somebody else's. It's understandable. People got different visions. Mm -hmm. You know, things don't work He's out. He's been doing it for over 13 years. Right. So he has his mindset on how he wants to do things, and I have my mindset on how I want things. Sometimes people can't come to a medium right. where everything is peaceful. So to, you know, to alleviate any problems, we just stay cordial and focus on our visions. Right. Um, speaking on, you know, you said you're going to have your daughter, you know, maybe start going to some of these dog shows and, you know, getting into the junior handling thing. Is is it any particular shows you got in mind for 2024 um, yet or? Yeah, it's um, just it just depends on the litter um, and how old the puppies, hopefully when they get here, how old they'll be, if it's going to even have a show in somewhere in Ohio. Like Columbus has shows. Um, Allentown, PA is a good local show. Um, just somewhere local, not too right. far, right. where she's not overwhelmed. Start kind of small. We don't want to take her to a show when it's 300 to 500, right, right. something small, personal. I said that's why we work with the dog. She's comfortable with the dog. She can be around other dogs without being scared. And the most important thing is the dogs will be trained because. That's some of the things people don't understand with these shows. If a dog isn't trained, you didn't lost before you even got in the ring. Right, right, <laughs> right. All right, with that being said, um, where can people reach you at on social media once again if they wanted to get in contact with you? My main page is Instagram, Cartier10, and you can message me, DM me uh, for any questions. I post a lot. <laughs> I post um, feeding regimens, what I feed my dogs. I post training. I post socialization with my daughter. Sometimes I do lives, ask a couple questions. So Instagram is my main page, and I will post things on TikTok as well. All right. Um, it was a pleasure, man, and an honor bringing you, you know, to the show today. Um, it was a pleasure meeting you and your family. Um, Hopefully I can get you back out in the near future for, you know, another show, another update on what's going on. And um, that's it for the day, man. Appreciate you. Thanks for the, for the interview. All right. Allied Bully TV. And we out of here like yesterday. <laughs> this episode of Allied Bullies TV is being brought to you by K9 Super Supplements Puppy Formula. This awesome supplement contains green tripe, goat's milk, biotin, along with six other ingredients to promote growth and development, support immunity, digestive health, bone health, and also skin and coat health. Head on over to K9SuperSupplements.com today and grab yours.